Kia ora and welcome to another Aotearoa Rugby Pod. I'm Ross Carl, joined by the usual suspects very soon. But what do we have for you in today's episode? Well, we'll have a look at Bowden Barrett and Richie Moonga. The talk of the town has been how those two guys are going in World Cup year through Super Rugby. In comparison to, say, Damien McKenzie... It looked a lot better from both of those blokes on the weekend. We'll have a little look into that. How the competition is going halfway through. Who are the teams to beat? Are the Hurricanes, who are equal top of the table, actually up there as equal top of the table? Or is it just that they've got that game in hand? A few viewer questions as well about how we could look at rugby in the future. Should Super Rugby continue? What about the NPC? How do we fit that in all together? Plenty of viewer feedback, actually, this week. Before we get to that, let's go to the guys... In the big screen, Bryn Hall, as ever, coming out of Japan and James Parsons swanning it on the Coromandel, <laughs> as he loves to do during the holiday period. Haven't seen the shirt off on Insta yet? No, not yet, not yet. I uh, don't think we'll be doing that uh, this week. <laughs> this weekend, as the bloat goes up, you, you just don't want that to go on with all those hot cross buns. Yeah, I've, I've probably had a few too many hot cross buns, so I think uh, I'll, I'll uh, save you from that. <laughs> Bryn, what does Easter look like for you guys in Japan? Not a lot, mate. Just obviously donning a, a black eye for making a making a tackle on the weekend. That's really pretty much the highlight of my um, of my uh, Easter weekend. Last week, yep. we had a lot of response, guys, especially in the comment section on YouTube, about what it looks like with Bowden Barrett and Richie Mwonga and Damien McKenzie as the first five eights through this competition and looking towards the World Cup. We had a lot of chat last week. Both of you said, you know, essentially class is permanent. And you look at that weekend, Jipper, you're pretty happy with that summation considering how Bowden Barrett performed against the Rebels? Yeah, look, he was very classy. There's no, there's no doubt about that. I think Richie Moonga was very strong as well. Um, and, and I, I mean, one week doesn't make a player, and I think that's what we were probably trying to say last week. Um, and I think the big thing will be seeing those players... Um, step up in those, I suppose, those bigger derbies that, that will be just around the corner, especially I think the Blues have um, got the Crusaders uh, again, so that'll that'll be a big fixture down in Christchurch. Bryn, when you look at those kind of ups and downs in a player's career through Super Rugby, which is a long season, I mean, it's 15 weeks of regular season play, if you're down on confidence, do you target some of the lesser teams and go, OK, this is the place that I need to play really well to get myself going again? Do, do players look at it that way and go, OK, the Rebels is my chance, and if I do well there, when I get to the derbies, I'll be looking sweet? You're trying to set me up, Ross, saying the Rebels aren't a good team? <laughs> Who wouldn't do that? Uh, <laughs> no. Um, no, I don't think you think as a player. You definitely don't um, look on the calendar saying... Um, you know, if I've had a run of good performances that you are playing a lesser a lesser team. I just think it, it comes back to more so your preparation and getting that right. And from all accounts from hearing from the Blues, and Jip can probably attest to this, that his preparation would be world-class and have been able to know exactly what a week looks like. But, you know, sometimes um, it just comes at different parts of the season. And I think you look at Richie and Bodie on the weekend, both of them were able to influence the game, uh, whether that be run, kick or, or pass. And so, you know, Richie had two try assists, one being lucky for Springer with the bounce of the ball. But... You know, I look, I look at Bowden Barrett's, um, I guess, his try assist for Mark Talia with the ability to be able to chip and chase, seeing the space in behind, and then to put it on his foot again uh, for Mark Talia. You know, that's that's Bowden Barrett that we know that we know and love and want to hopefully continue to see. But, um, yeah, I think, like we said, class is permanent, and if they're not based around three or four performances before that um, and not playing well, um, it's always going to happen. But I think for me, more importantly, when it comes into the big stages, you know, that's where I find, you know, the Richies and the um, the Bodies, that's when I really step up and you'll see them be more pivotal um, against these, you know, for example, against Moana and um, the Rebels on the weekend. Jeb, you spent a fair bit of time with Bowden Barrett in Blues camp. You know, we saw his the disappointment on his face against the Chiefs with the things that didn't go to plan for him. How would he have reacted within camp? Like, what would you have seen from Bowden Barrett within Blues camp during the last week heading into the Rebels? I don't think you would have seen it a lot different in his preparation. Like, I think consistent preparation gets that consistent performance. Uh, the, the one thing I would say, though, guys like Finlay Chrisley and Bowden Barrett play best off fast ball. Uh, and the Blues got their ruck tempo and their attacking end down to those sort of low two second um, rucks and, and that just allows those sorts of guys to be the very best uh, version of themselves so I think that plays a massive part in their performance being better this week. 
I suppose the question really is when you think about that ruck speed and how that's going to work for international selection, are the All Blacks capable of getting that kind of ruck speed to allow these kind of players to play the game they want to play, Brent? Well, I guess that's the challenge that I alluded to probably a couple of weeks ago around where the Northern Hemisphere is at the moment around the breakdown efficiency. And so, look, I think the Blues are probably one of the better teams in the competition when it comes to that quick ball. Look, you don't score 41 unanswered points in the second half if those big boys aren't doing the job um, around with the breakdown, your clean out and being able to ball carry as well. Like I thought Nepal Alala had one of his better games as well, especially with ball on hand. I thought he was physical, was able to get over the advantage line and even the bench, the likes of Sewell Four coming on, Robertson is, and co um, were really good around that area. So yeah, like I said, I think the challenge for the New Zealand teams um, is to consistently keep getting better in that breakdown efficiency because when we do go into that Northern Hemisphere and into that World Cup and playing those teams, that breakdown's got to be that two-second or three-second phase because we do know the All Blacks, when they do play at a tempo, you've got the ability of Barrett, Moanga and Co to be able to run and, um, I guess, influence what they did on the weekend. It's difficult, isn't it? Like it's, not, it's just not that straightforward to be able to play the kind of game that they want to play. It's not, but, I mean, Test Match level football is a little bit different. I mean, I think trying to expect two-second two ball, um, you know, is probably not as fair at that international level. A, a big factor of um, the success of the Northern Hemisphere sides are the defensive efforts at that breakdown. So I, I don't think we, we can't really compare Super Rugby and Test Match football um, to, that, to that level. What I do know, though, is that we, we've got a number of players that have the ability to do so. And I think we use the Chiefs as an example. You look at that pack, and the number of All Blacks that are performing really, really well, if we go uh, towards the World Cup with that sort of mindset in the carry and the collision area, especially the Retalics mm -hmm. and the Samasoni Takiahos, Sam Kane as well, um, you know, I, th I think we'll give ourselves the best opportunity to let guys like Richie Moanga and Bowden Barrett play their very best football. Mm. Uh, Finlay Christie, you mentioned just before, Bryn, he looked sharp on the weekend. There's been a lot of chat about halfbacks and who's going to fit in there with Aaron Smith and possibly Brad Weber. Maybe Finlay Christie hasn't had as much attention as Cameron Rickard, but he looked good. Finlay Christie has been playing consistently the whole year, whether it be his speed, of, speed to ruck, his, his efficiency and his, and his passing. His kicking game hasn't been as, as much as a focal point, obviously, with Bowden Barrett doing a lot more kicking, but... His tenacity in defence, he's got the ability to be able to do turnovers and a great communicator as well. So I think he's had a great start to the season. And I think, for me, I, I touched on, for me, the, the three halfbacks at the moment, you'd have to go Weber, Smith, and I'd have Finlay Christie at three, and Cam Roygaard really, really close for that fourth spot. But I think Finlay Christie, he's had an outstanding start to the end, probably hasn't got enough praise, but I think he's been great this year for sure. Considering the way that Roygaard played in the Hurricanes' 29-14 win over the Highlanders, probably outplayed Fakatava to some degree. Is that the way you see it as far as the picking order goes? I think he is the incumbent. Uh, Christie is there. It, I just find it hard because it's Aaron Smith, Brad Webber and Finlay Christie, I feel are, are quite similar players. And I do like the ability to have, um, I suppose, a nine that's a little bit different. I think that Cam Roygaard, Fakatava and Peter Nara are probably fighting for that one spot because I think I think those All Black coaches will want that that point of difference. So I feel it, it's obviously Aaron Smith is going to be there, and then it's between Finlay Christie or Brad Weber uh, for that second spot, and then they've got to go for something a little bit different. Um, and and I mean I think Roy Guard's probably leaving the pack at the moment in, in terms of that, that third spot. I just wouldn't be surprised as well. I don't know if they can do this, but it's more so if you're going to pick the three with experience coming the World Cup year. Taking Roygaard as a, on tour as an apprentice or being able to just get him in that environment. If he's not selected, just get him in the environment. I'm not too sure what the logistics are around that, Jip, but I think get him in, in that environment. If they are going to go with the experience of the three nines, that could be another way where you could see a Cam Roygaard kind of, kind of popping in and getting into that environment if not selected. There isn't a lot of time to trial things this year, though, is there, Bryn? Like, really, there's a very short rugby championship, you know. It's a tough year to make a late charge. Yeah, it is, but I think at the same time, you know, it comes to form. You know, we talked a lot around guys that have had opportunities and played really well in Super Rugby seasons in World Cup years. Severis is, um, was, was, a, was a clear example. Nehemiah Milda Scudder having that one year as well. But I think you still have the ability to, to, to pick him, and they know what they can probably get with Brad and TJ, and very similar to last year, they didn't pick them and they, they took Fakatava to have a look at him, knowing that you can pick TJ and, and Brad in the back end of the season. They could probably do that again if they wanted to, really, having to know what, know what they're going to get with Brad and TJ. 
um, we've in Finlay as the example. Get Rory Gard in there for the rugby championship. It's three games. It's a, it's a pretty short rugby championship. Give him a go. If it doesn't work out, at least you give him a, a chance and you can be able to go back to the tried and true of the experienced players. But you are right. There isn't a lot of time and it will be interesting to see if the All Blacks do give him that opportunity if Rory Gard continues to keep playing at this level that he has at the start of the competition. Bryn, you listed Christie's pillars of his game, the things that you were impressed with. When you look at those elements of Roy Gard's game, does he have the same level across the board, or is it just his running game that's at the same level? Well, he's got a good pass. I, I wouldn't say he's obviously your Aaron Smith mould around getting the ball out as fast as Finlay Christie does, uh, because I just think with the Blues, a lot of their attack has been able to get the ball out to Bowden Barrett and then been able to then make the plays off the pods from that to get their outside backs going. But I had a look at Roy Gard on the weekend. He had 10 carries on the weekend, and I know he had 75 um, carry metres, and one of that was what's an intercept try. But you don't see those kind of numbers in halfbacks in New Zealand carrying that many times, and he's consistently done that in this competition. The only other player that you talk in world rugby is, uh, is DuPont. He has those kind of numbers around carry metres and being able to um, run the ball like that. So um, that's what Cam Roygaard, I guess, his um, his positiveness is around if he was selected. He has that running game, which Whakatawa was chosen for last year, to bring something different. But he still has the great skill set of being able to get the ball out. He's got a great pass and he's got a great kicking game with the left foot option as well, whether it be contestable and a long kicking game as well. Out of those 10 carries, do you reckon they were all on? Or was he overplaying his hand a little? Yeah, it's a good it's a good point, Jip. I, I look at that probably at the all-black level as well. Um, the speed of ball and getting the ball out is really important. If you're looking through Aaron Smith and even, you know, with TJ Pedernada and those boys are there, it was getting that ball out really quick. And so I think what the Hurricanes do, though, they have given him a licence to be able to be instinctive, instinct, instinctive around his running game. Um, you know, do you want to, I guess, pick your timings a little bit better? Of course. But in saying that, that's his, that's his kind of positiveness that he has in his game. Um, and look, I guess the... The, the Hurricanes won't be, want, won't be wanting to pull that out of him because he's been really good around that. And I think Jamie Booth's been great in and around that area as well. Um, but I guess timing will be important at the next level because I don't think you're going to see the same gaps. And I guess the importance of tempo and getting that ball out in the All Blacks is really important, as you've seen for Aaron Smith doing that for the last decade. What have the Hurricanes done to allow him to run like that, Jipper? They've obviously structured around him in some degree. I, I think they've um, really focused on attacking around the heart. And I suppose... By the heart, I mean the breakdown. If you look at the Highlanders' game, a lot of their tries came through, you know, Rayasi and Co. picking through the middle, or Roygaard, Booth, um, doing doing the same thing. So, for a running nine, and Bryn will be able to attest to this more than me, but if you're clearing bodies around that breakdown, you're giving yourself opportunities to sort of pick easy meters up through the middle. Um, it, it sets you sets you apart. It, it lets you, uh, I suppose, have the strength of your game, of your running game. But also, if they start to tighten, he can still get the ball away and, and, and find space. So if you then look at the way that Ian Foster's All Blacks have played over the last two or three years, Bryn, do you feel like they will set themselves up to allow a person like Cam Roygaard or Flau Fakatava to be able to snipe in the way that they have? Well, it depends, really. I think it comes back to the carry and clean, which we've touched on a little bit and how important that is, because... I think, you know, Aaron Smith's our, our, an out-and-out one, and you'd have to think that he's going to be able to start games. And when you do bring on that impact, whether it be whoever it might be, we're using Cam Roygaard as an example, he does have the ability to be able to snipe and be able to break tackles. Um, and I was really actually surprised with his speed, even for that intercept. You know, when he got that um, intercept, I was like, oh, is he going to go all the way here? And did it pretty pretty comfortably. So he's obviously got a lot of turn of pace, which is, which is great at the international level. So um, I think... Any halfback can pass the ball. Again, New Zealand, rug New Zealand rugby, New Zealand nines, it's pretty common around getting their ball out fast, and they try they do that at the Hurricanes as well. But what Rory Gard is at the doing at the moment, which is different, he has the ability to be able to run, and he's actually setting up people as well. You look at Blackwell's try, perfect example of a running nine and being able to not overplay your hand. Could have gone for that try close to the line, but pops it up for, for Blackwell close to the line, and then scores that try. So he's got a great balance in the moment, and hopefully it continue with Pedernada coming back shortly as well. How about Fakatava, Jip? Is he in a place that he should be at at this time, heading towards the World Cup? Well, I don't think he would say he's where he wants to be. You know, like an ACL playing without an ACL is pretty pretty tough. Like he's, um, you can't question his character. But I think he's getting better and better as the weeks go on. I don't know. Again, I'll, I'll probably lean on Bryn here, but I think you know his, his running game and his, I suppose, his ability to manipulate the game and have an impact. Uh, in, a, in a positive light, is improving from from where I sit. 
Look, I think the thing with Falau is it's been able to be understanding and being patient in moments um, because look, I love his ability and his X factor. He can turn a, a game on his head and you can see there's a lot of scenarios that you saw on the weekend where his ability to be able to play with the ball was offloading his game, been able to step in and around that hard defence. But I think for him at the moment, I think it's just been able to game game understanding, game situation of finding the right the right player at the right time and not overplaying your hand. Like we touched on Cam with, with Egypt, being able to overplay his hand a little bit. Has he been doing that? We can't really comment on that. I think he's been pretty good around that balance. But I think the balance in Falau's game of being able to snipe when, it, when it's on and then being able to have that game management role is still something that I think he's building on. But um, he has shown in the past that he can do that. And I guess that's the um, that's the challenge for him moving forward, um, to be able to get that game balance and game understanding and getting the right things at the right time and influencing like you see Aaron Smith when he's able to do that in, in that Highlander squad. The Hurricanes have moved up into equal top place. They've played one extra game than the Chiefs, but they are taking on the Chiefs this weekend, so that will sort that out. Do the Hurricanes, Jip, to you, look like a team that's top of the table? Are they a team that will be there at the end? Because I don't think anyone really picked them to be at the top of the table. I think even ourselves here probably underrated them in our original predictions, but I definitely think they are now a, a top four side and definitely worthy of being at the top of the table. Um, and I think a lot of it's to do around their breakdown. Uh, and I don't just mean on the attacking side. We've talked a lot about Cam Roygaard and um, how, clini how clinical they've been around clearing bodies. But, man, some of the impacts they're having uh, around slowing opposition ball down is, is massive. And I think Duplessis Karifi has been um, huge the last two weeks in particular. You know, Adi Savia, uh, a number of crucial turnovers um, on the weekend. So I, I actually think that's one of their biggest strengths at the moment is actually slowing the opposition's ball down, which gives their defensive system time to set. We know Corey Jane loves that rush defence from outside to in, and, and it's it's allowing them to be at their very best. And if you look at the Chiefs... Lastly on that... God. So just lastly on that, I think their bench has played a massive role in the last couple of weeks. Um, I even think on the weekend, um, the, the influence that they're having from their bench, and I know probably going to the back end of the season and, and trying to play 80-minute performances against, you know, the Derby games against the Chiefs or your Crusaders or your Blues, for example, bringing on your bench and being able to have a whole 23-man squad performing really well in games um, is really important. I think the Hurricanes bench, especially on the weekend and even previously before, they're all having a massive role in being able to influence games. And so I think it's setting themselves up really well for this Chiefs. It's a good litmus test, I think. I think they've had a bit of an easy draw, uh, but they have gained confidence and they've beaten the people that they've needed to. But I think the next coming month, I think for the Hurricanes, we'll get a really good idea around how they're going to sit. But right now, definitely with the way they're playing, definitely a top four team. Uh, but they've got a, a tough month ahead, which we're going to find out a lot more about this Hurricanes team. Yeah, it's interesting. They've lost to the Blues. They play the Chiefs, Chiefs this week. They haven't played the Crusaders or the Brumbies. So you're right. You know, it has been a relatively easy run to here and a much, much tougher run home when we look at this side, the Hurricanes. Do you think they can beat the Chiefs this weekend? They are at home, Jip. Yeah, look, I definitely think they're capable of winning, especially being at home. Um, I... I it's a, it's a hard one, especially with the Chiefs coming off a bye. Um, you know, it, you, sometimes the bye comes at the wrong time when, you, when you're when you playing well. Um, so I think if there's ever a time to get them is actually, ironically, off the back of a bye uh, when they've probably hit peak form. I feel like the Hurricanes are really humming. They've got a lot of confidence in their game. Um, but I, I do still think, you know, the Chiefs will go in as favourites. Uh, it's, it's just, I just find it hard to pick against them at the moment. The Chiefs, they've just got so many guys playing well. Um, they're, they're really confident in the way they want to play. They put the ball in the right parts of the field. Um, so I, I, although it is at Wellington, um, I, I still think the Chiefs probably go in as favourites. Brad? Yeah. I definitely think the Chiefs this week will be wanting to slow down that ball because, um, you know, Cam Roygaard's been talked a lot and around his ability to be able to snipe. I think they'll be pretty brutal, and I can probably see Brody Retallick getting in that ruck uh, a lot more to try and make it a bit of a nuisance for Cam Roygaard this week because I think, yeah, that's one of the things that the Chiefs do really well come break breakdown time. We've touched on Sam Kane throughout the year and how good he's been in around that breakdown area, but you've got Luke Jacobs and you've got Penny who's been playing really, Fino has been playing really well, and you've got the ability of that, that tight five that's playing really consistently at the moment. So, um, yeah, it'll be a bit of the eights. And, um, but in saying the Hurricanes have been playing real, really well, but like I said, it's a great litmus test and see, to see where they're at. Uh, but, yeah, I think it'll be a little bit tough. Um, I think the Chiefs might just, they'll, they'll just pip them, but it'll be a tight game.
Brent, before we let you go, I really want to hear a little bit about your thoughts on the Crusaders versus Moana Pacifica. The Crusaders appeared to be in a bit of trouble at half-time before blowing out in the second half and taking that win 38-21. What was going on there with the Crusaders through that first half? They're just not quite where they need to be. Yeah, I think just the energy and their intent. I think, um, you know, Scott Hansen talked around it a lot. Um, they weren't the first five metres, I guess, then being able to sit early wasn't where they where they needed to be. And, I um, mean, you know, I think Moana Pacifica, man, they played well in that first half. Jips touched on it a lot um, around their continuity and being able to uh, win breakdowns and being able to hold on to the ball for long periods of time. And I think the Moana did that. And to be honest, uh, Jimmy the Jet, um, what an unbelievable game from from the winger. And you've also got Levi Armour and, and Willie Harvilli, who I thought was really good. Um, you know, there was that span of five minutes where they were able to pounce on the, the Corey Callow um, yellow card. But, um, yeah, I think you know, they'll be a little bit disappointed. I think um, they're going into the bye. I think it's a really important time for that group to go into the bye. I think with the injuries that they've had and, I guess, the, the cavalry that's going to be coming back, having five and two um, probably isn't, I suppose, isn't probably where they want it to be. But with that loss to Ndrua, uh, they've been able to pick up points. Uh, probably a few more bonus points would have been nice for them. But um, the bye's come at a good time. And I think you're going to see a lot more better performances coming in the next month or so with these All Blacks and uh, with other players coming back. I'm into the fold. Thanks, Bryn. We've got to let you go there. You head off to training. And we'll catch you again next week. Thanks. Sounds good. Hey, we said goodbye to Brenner, But, Jip, I'm really keen to understand a little bit more about Moana Pacifica because we've talked about them a bit. You know, their place on the table probably doesn't indicate the strengths that they've got and the fact that they're able to push teams for a period of time. What's happening to them as they fall away in those second halves and blowing these games? I think the hardest thing for them is their attacking stats are actually right at the pointy end of the competition. They, they, they're they great at winning collisions. They're great at getting fast ruck speed. Um, you know, they're great at, um, you know, I suppose, getting across the game line. I think they're, they're first in the comp um, on that. But the, the biggest thing is, is, and we say it, and I hate it because it is a cliche, but defence wins championships. Um, and that, that's, that's where they fall off the end. I, you know, Bryn sort of spoke about the Hurricanes' impact they're getting from the bench. And it, we've seen time and time again for Moana, um, you know, from the 60-minute mark to the 80-minute mark, there's been a massive spike in points scored against them. Um, so I, I think what they get from their bench, but also um, the players that are remaining on there for 80 minutes need to, need to really sort of stay in the grind. But I do think the move with McClutchy at 10, I feel like their kicking game's getting a better balance. He, he's got a good feel in terms of when to run, but when to put the ball um, in front of his bigger forwards and, and conserving that energy, if that makes sense. Because sometimes you play too much rugby in your own half or you play too much rugby between the two tens um, and it's just wasted energy because you're actually not breaking down defences. Um, so I think that balance of their kicking game um, is getting better. But they've just got to stop the points. I mean, that's it. I mean, they're just leaking too many points. They're scoring plenty. As I said, their stats are, are impressive on attack. Um, but, you know, if, if you leak more than you score, unfortunately, you come out um, second. Are they falling out of system or are they falling off tackles? Um, I, it's hard because I don't know their system, if I'm honest. But um, I, I think... Uh, there's a lot of um, probably guys are coming off the bench and, and when you're fresh and you've got a guy next to you that's you know been playing 70 minutes and you've been on for 10 minutes and you fly out of that line, it's a little chink in your armour and I, I feel like it's those sort of connections that are causing them the most problem, the back end of their games. It, it's almost like the bench are trying to have such a big impact that they leave uh, their mates behind a little bit. And that's, and that's you know, if you use Milani Nanai's flick pass, it was just a disconnected line. He got between two defenders. Yes, it was a freakish pass, but he won the collision by that separation, which allowed them in behind, and then they score, obviously, off that. And is that just a communication thing, to hold a line together? How does that work? <sighs> it's definitely a communication thing, but... Like I say, like it's it's just controlling your emotions. Like I was guilty of it when I played, especially early in my career. When you come off the bench, you try to almost do too much as an individual. Um, and I and I think when you said, um, are they breaking down the system? It's not that they're breaking down the system. I just think there's individuals trying to make such a big impact 
that they're not doing it, um, you know, in sync, I suppose. Mm. You talked about Milani Nanai. What a great pickup for the Crusaders. I mean, at the Blues, he was just a one-man player-beating machine, wasn't he? And and to come out of nowhere into their team, wow. I still remember, uh, I think we were playing the Waratahs, and Israel Folau, big man, was over the try line, and Milani picked him up and drove him over the sideline and took him out. It was, it, like, he is so much stronger than you would you would realize like he's quite a you know a slight body but man he's just got so much power behind him um great to see he's come back um from his acl uh rehab um firing and and you know it was an awesome get for bay of plenty but it's a it's a great heads up play um for the crusaders they always seem to find these players um that just bolster the squad not only in terms of performance but what they can do at training during the week is is massive the Crusaders seem to have like that theory. If you use like a Mike Delaney previously, you know, like they do like that older athlete that can play a really strong role, um, I suppose, during the week, um, running the opposition plays and, and, you know, sort of driving that, not B side, but, you know, the guys that aren't getting regularly selected. Um, and time and time again, they pick these little gold nuggets. And I think Milani Nanai is almost their Mike Delaney. You know, they had Simon Hickey uh, last year. They always just have a, have, a, have a knack of picking up these guys that can add so much during the week just for your young playing group. But more importantly, when the, you know, you look at how many injuries they've got, the fact that he could come and play and make an impact like he did um, just shows, um, you know, I suppose their, their IQ when they're, when they're recruiting their squad and getting that balance right. One of the other things we've seen, and I touched on it a little bit earlier through this weekend, is this habit of teams getting blown out in the second half. The disconnect between the good teams and the second-rate teams seems to be continuing to a degree where you get to that second half and the Brumbies blow out to 52-24 out of nowhere. Why is this continuing across the board? Well, I actually think we have to celebrate it a little bit. Like, we've changed, we've made some rule adjustments that have meant there's a lot more ball in play and sides are fatiguing. And when they fatigue, you watch the you watch the discipline count go up. The Reds have 15 penalties. I mean, and, and I, I think the bulk, the 10 of those were in that second half. So as soon as you start fatiguing, you make poor decisions or, or you're a little bit sloppy in your clean out or you lose your feet. And then, lo and behold, you're just piggybacking the other opposition up the field. And as we know with the Brumbies, you, you do that, um, you get, you, you'll get punished. Same with the Crusaders, same with the Blues. Um, you know, the, the Rebels were right in that fixture. Um, probably, probably a little bit unfair on the Rebels. I think there was some actual individual brilliance that actually led to the Blues blowing out um, that much. But I still think it is these rule adjustments that are making sides fatigue. Um, and, and I suppose that the sides that are fatiguing aren't, it's again just going to that bench and the impact they're getting off, uh, off, the, off the pine is probably just not at the level um, of, of the opposition they're playing. We want to see a competition where there is the opportunity for there to be some sort of bo- you know, boil over, upset, whatever you want to call it. And the new rules are almost making it work the opposite way where depth and lack of fitness or whatever it might be is being shown up and really the predictions are easier than ever. Well, my tipping uh, wouldn't suggest that, but um, <laughs> others others obviously are doing a little bit better than me. I think I'm sitting in 59th, but I think if you look at the NRL, it's a little bit similar over there. There's a lot of blowouts. Um, you know, there, there are the odd type fiction. I think we'll continually see that with a lot of the derby games, um, but it, it's no different there. Like it, it, There is a there's a live, there's a level um, that some teams just can't live at, and and I, I think it is a, I, I think it is a good thing because it's it's going to make players want to get better, which will then hopefully you know these are new rules that have increased the ball and play. You know that preseason next year will see a tightening of of these sides, and and let's not forget the upsets like the the Drua have um, you know had a number of upsets. I still think. There's teams like uh, Moana Pacifica that will uh, get on the right side of a couple of these results. And, uh, you know, I suppose the Waratahs are coming into their own. Uh, the Brumbies have picked up a, a number of wins against Kiwi sides. So I still think there is that, um, I suppose, unpredictable 
uh, feeling when it comes to the results. I think it's a little bit different when there's four games a weekend. It makes it a little bit easier and in terms of, I suppose, proving that point. But I, I think there's a lot to like about the new rules in, in this competition. If you're within a Super Rugby tipping competition, the Aotearoa Rugby Pod League, there's 493 of you. So Jip's 59th place isn't that bad. He's only got three games wrong in comparison to first place. So first place is what picked 36 results, and Jip has picked 33. So it's not, it's not too bad. Like over the course yeah. of the season, it's not awful. Yeah, no, I'm happy with that actually. Yeah, it's it's made me feel better, Ross. Thanks. The, the problem is, is that so many people are able to pick these results because they're so predictable that it's really close at the top of the table. There are all these people who are at exactly the same well, number of points. It's the margin, though, isn't it? That's where you can um, really sort of set yourself apart as as getting as close as possible to that one game where you get to pick the margin. Uh, let's have a look at these results this weekend. Then MP versus the Reds. Where you're picking? I'm going to go MP. I, I, I think um, I think they're, they're due. You know, they shouldn't have not had a win when you look at their, their, their team statistically. So, uh, Brumbies versus the Drawer. Brumbies. I um, they, they 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 didn't play well the other night and they won convincingly. Um, statistically, they were well off uh, their best. So um, I, I think, although they'll be happy with the bonus point win, um, I think there'll be a few few stern words in their camp this week and, and they'll be better for it. The Waratahs versus the Force in Sydney? Waratahs. And then lastly, I think we've already touched on this, you think the Chiefs over the Canes in Wellington? I do, I do, but I think it, she'll be tight. She will be tight. I thought Aidan Morgan went well at 10, but I, I, I do think you know Brett Cameron will give them their best opportunity and, and having an Aidan Morgan come off the bench um, would, would be their best chance um, to sort of combat that Damian McKenzie, Sean Stevenson, 10-15 through. To our viewer questions, we're getting quite a few of them at the moment, whether it's by the email, Pod at sky.co.nz or through the YouTube chat section. There were over 100 comments on um, Damien McKenzie versus Bowden Barrett versus Richie Moore, and we've already covered that off. The other key ones, one was an email from a bloke called Jack Joseph Vito, who had a very similar question to a bloke on YouTube called Kano is King. So I'm wondering whether they're the same person. I'm not sure. But essentially he's saying, let's scrap Super Rugby, go back to the NPC, create some tribalism, basically lose the Australians, and then have a relegation system, a bunch of the Silver Lake money into it. That is where he's coming from. Is it realistic, really, to run the NPC as a competition in New Zealand, a fully professional competition, considering the amount of players, the amount of money that's in New Zealand rugby? Oh, look, I love the idea of it. Like, I mean, as a kid growing up, um, you know, the NPC was sort of my first sort of touch with rugby and, and getting behind a team. Um, and then Super Rugby came around, and, and you know I do think we have to acknowledge, like since not playing the South African sides, maybe it's made it a little bit harder for us as a rugby nation to to sort of go up up and, and challenge these Northern Hemisphere sides. So I, I think that's one reason why you would sort of not go towards this, because when you play the same style and you get used to that it, it doesn't allow you the ability to adapt um, and, and I suppose challenge at that all black level so I, I think staying um, obviously with with Australia and the Pacific teams um, is, is crucial to our success at, at, at that all black level um, but I, I understand how everyone has this infatuation but again the Australian market and not to get too businessy on on a rugby podcast, but that's a lot of um, eyeballs that that bring obviously a lot of money into our game as well. Those days are gone of seeing seeing those big crowds at those sort of provincial games because everyone talks about how much they love the NPC, but there's still not a lot of bums on seats either. Um, and some of the some of that um, football that's played um, is, is spectacular. So I, I think a lot of people just like viewing um, rugby from home and. Maybe we need to lend ourselves more towards that NFL, NBA, where it's, I suppose, more of a grand um, spectacle um, with, with bands and all sorts that, that gets people um, out and, and watching the game. The in-stadium festival. I think the best one that I've seen that I've been to internationally was in Buenos Aires. 
next to the stadium. They had a festival, there was food, there was drink. The players who weren't playing were involved. The kids have got games. There are bouncy castles. It really was a day out at the rugby, you know, and I wonder whether yeah. that's, that's the thing that we're missing. When I played my first game in South Africa um, in Durban against the Sharks and we pulled up <laughs> in a bus... And there's just boot parties, there's live bands, like it's a complete another whole day. Um, as a player, that was amazing. And then our after match was, you know, out um, with the public and the boot parties. And, you know, there there is an element of that, that, you know, it get, one, it gets the players a little bit more connected to the fans. And, and, you know, I suppose that closer bond and that closer connection is what drives people to want to turn up and, and be part of these fixtures. Yeah, Kings Park Durban is a hell of a place. <laughs> it's a hell oh. of a place to go to a test match as well. The boot parties, the bries are cooking, everything is going, the music is on, people are in a good mood by kickoff. Like if you haven't experienced that in <laughs> your rugby good. watching life, that is one place that you need to watch some rugby. It is quite like anything else. It is quite a fantastic thing. Arnaz13, I think that's how you say it from YouTube. Why wouldn't the All Blacks play Sam Kane at six, Dalton Papali at seven, with Adi Savia at eight? We don't have a better six, he says. Then Kane is a tackling machine, um, very consistent in defence. It'll let Papali Papali'i do the athletic, enigmatic stuff. I think Dalton can play six, if I'm honest. I, I, I think Sam's an out and out seven, um, and and Dalton has that athletic ability to be a line out option. Um, obviously a threat at the breakdown, but he's a big ball carrier. He's a power athlete. Uh, when I saw this question, I, I, I genuinely thought, I, I don't mind that trio. I think it's a great trio, but I, I, I would put Dalton at six rather than, and keep Sam at seven. I mean, when you look at the other six options around the country, though, there are a number. Akira Ioane's there as well. He's got, obviously got a knee injury. Uh, I think Shannon Frizzell has the ability to play that. Blackadder was... To come back from his injury and the, the form he hit straight away was was seriously impressive, similar to Joe Moody. Um, so he, he's got to be considered. Uh, oh, we've got a lot of six like Jacobson. Man, I, I, I don't know. I don't, I, he he is so impressive. Um, you know, he has to be considered um, a genuine option. He's a great line out, and I'm, or maybe I'm just thinking from a hooker's point of view, but he's a great line out op option. Um, great round the park. Um, so, I mean, there's a lot of um, players that you can sort of line up in that six jersey, but I can see the thought um, in that question. Um, the only thing I just see it differently, I just think Sam's an out-and-out out seven, and he, he's really, really good at that seven role around the breakdown and the tackle, and whereas Dalton can play that sort of explosive six role that we've seen from Jerome Kaino and the likes previously. Anyone who watched the show knows that I'm the president of the Luke Jackson fan club, but to be fair, you know, it's been four years since he busted into that 2019 World Cup squad, and the fanfare isn't quite as loud for him. Is he just doing his job, and because he's the kind of player he is who just is willing to do the dirty stuff, maybe he's just not getting noticed in the same way? Oh, I think it would be hard not to notice him this season. Um, he's He's got some very sharp shoulders at the moment um, in that tackle, um, and, and he's been great with ball in hand. And as I say, in terms of his core roles, having the ability of um, you know what he does at scrum time and, and how he helps his props out when under pressure and, and what he does at line-out time, I, I, I think he's he's right in the mix. I hope so, because I, I think he's got a lot to add at test level. He feels like a test player to me. He's hitting like a test player at the moment. Um, you know, he's had a few injury uh, niggles over the years that probably hasn't allowed him to play at, at the potential we know he's capable of. But, man, whew, some of the shots he's putting at the moment, he is, as I said, he's got very sharp shoulders at the moment. So um, he's, he's, making a, he's making a charge at the right time, I'd say. So many people to consider in World Cup year and week on week. I suppose we try hard not to just be knee-jerk, but it's impossible not to be as, as performances go on and on. And we, I suppose we've seen that in the last couple of weeks with Bowden Barrett and Damien McKenzie and those conversations. But it's far more fun to have the conversations than to ignore the week by week, Jipper. Isn't it great that you've got this many players? Like We talk about it every week. You know, There's a new player every week. We're trying to consider how do you fit them into the squad. Uh, you'd much rather have that problem than... Uh, having a solid 32 that you just pick time and time again, in, in my opinion. <laughs> Unless it's the 2015 World Cup 32, 33, and then, you know, yeah, yeah, <laughs> you're happy to just go, OK, they're yeah. the world's best and 
Awesome. Let's go with that. Okay, well, thank you very much once again, James Parsons, for uh, joining us on the Aotearoa Rugby Pod. We'll see you again next week. Cheers, Ross. Always a pleasure, my friend. Okay, mate. Catch you soon. And uh, we'll catch you as well next week on the Aotearoa Rugby Pod. Catch us on YouTube. Catch us on Sky. Catch all the reaction on rugbypass.com to what's going on in the world of rugby. Catch us around next week. Matewa. Matewa.